Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Have you ever had the thought, I really am not saving enough for the future? And at the same time, you're sitting down to write an enormous check to the IRS every single year for a hundred, two hundred and fifty, five hundred thousand dollars in taxes. Guess what? We just found the money that you should be saving, and it's been under your nose the entire time. Go to freetaxwebinar.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com and learn how the wealthy are paying less in taxes. You can implement these strategies so that the next check you write will be to your financial future and not to the IRS. Welcome. This is the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Your host, Joey, the Italian stallion Mure, joined by Russ, the idea guy, Morgan. Russ, we are continuing to review Becoming Your Own Banker, the epic book by Nelson Nash that all this is based off of. Can you believe we're already in our fifth episode on this book? Yeah, and at this pace, we may finish this within six months. We're I mean, only on we, page 19 and 20, by the way. <laughs> I love this, Joe. You and I love to go fast on a lot of things. And I know some of you are listening to this like, Russ, you talk so slow. I have to put this <laughs> in order to actually hear you in my normal voice. So I know we don't talk fast, but we tend to go fast. But as it relates to this book, it's fun going through it two pages at a time. Well, you and I have different ideas on this because we've never really talked about this book individually, one-on-one at this pace. So there's things that you've been thinking this whole time, things that I've been thinking. And I'm sure if you've read this book, you have been having your own thoughts. So I'm glad we can all kind of collaborate here. So today. We're going to actually break down, uh, again, page 19 and 20, creating a bank like the ones you already know about. And what Nelson goes through, he starts off with this really onerous process, right? How to start up a physical bank, like going to the commissioner, getting, raising $20 million in capital, finding location, blah, 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 blah. Like this is not a process that anybody's really like excited about doing. Well, and I think it kind of points back to what he had covered two chapters ago within the grocery store. He said there's a lot of work to get into that business. And then last episode, when we talked about the problem and controlling your environment, it's really all of this is culminating into what does a bank do? How does it make money? So really quickly, Stanley, I got to share the story. Sunday morning, I'm sitting in Sunday school. I'm talking to an older guy. He's probably in his mid to late 50s. And we're just talking about life. And I kind of shared with him some stuff going on in mine. And I said, you know, tell me about your life. And he said, yeah, I'm just really like looking forward to the end of my working career. Oh, man. Wow. (laughs) Tell me, you know, like, what would you do? This is my famous question I love to ask when I'm talking to people about, you know, when they want to quote unquote retire. I said, you know, what would you do with all that spare time? Because I know this guy is an architect. He probably spends 50, 60 hours easy a week working, what are you going to do with all that free time? And so you kind of start sharing, you know, volunteer work. And I'm thinking, yeah, that takes 10 hours of the week. What are you doing with the other 75, you know? But (laughs) at the end of the day, you know, as he started talking it out, he said, well, really, if I just had something that fit my schedule better, right? Right now, my job is pretty demanding. It's taking all my time. I would, I really love what I do. And he started telling me about all these different ideas of opportunities that exist. And I start asking him question and question and question. And he finally turns around and looks at me, Stallion, and says, well, you've given me a homework assignment, hadn't you? <laughs> and I was like, man, I, I'm sorry. That, that's just what I do. And he, he says, well, how, how does that have anything to do with finance? Interesting. What do you think helping invest in ourselves, finding ways to control our environment has to do with finance? Well, it has everything to do with it. Right, it does. That, but that's the opposite of the way people have been taught. They've been taught to give their money to others and let somebody else control the environment. It's like literally looking at the weather channel, hoping you can go play golf. Because, right. I mean, you want the weather guy to d- dictate whether or not you can have an event outside? I mean, that is not a very successful opportunity. That's right. So, so let's talk about that. What was really on the other side 
of finance in his mind was the fact that he could get what he really wants, which is time freedom. It has nothing to necessarily do with what he's doing, it has everything to do with what he wants it to happen. And finance is the means to the end. So thus, the importance of creating a bank is because it's going to enhance or make us get to that end goal faster. True or false? Absolutely true. And even more so, think about the fact of surrounding yourself with the community. We just advertised the fact that we have this community coming up and we really want you to sign up. We are going to send you out this stuff, whether or not you get in the community or not. I think you're going to want to the amount of things that you're going to have. But here's one of the key points that's going to come out of that community is you're going to be surrounded by other people pursuing freedom, freedom to control their environment environment, freedom to control their time. Yeah. And who are you going to learn from the people around you that are just stuck in the rut of everyday life or the people that are striving and looking for ways to get there faster, more efficiently. This is, this is absolutely invaluable. Well, and today we're, we're talking about how banks work, right? These are, you know, we're going to do these weekly trainings inside of this community. And one of the things that we love to do is just teach some very basic things, but it wasn't basic to us when we first learned it. So when you read page 19 and Nelson Nash starts saying, hey, look, I don't mind telling people something very simple because if three out of five people don't realize we have to import oil, <laughs> we can get down to the basics. And he says, most people don't understand that when a bank starts up, they have to build up all of this capital, go through all this rigorous rigorous um, like startup like to get the charter and to get a building and to hire employees they have to raise this huge amount of money, but most people don't realize that a bank cannot lend their own capital. Whose okay. money do they lend? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. People are saying, wait a minute, a bank has capital. That's how they lend me money, right, Russ? I mean, come on. The answer is no. You can't. No. Banks cannot lend their own money. Whose money do they lend? Ours, the depositors. They, they lend deposits. That's why when you see a brand new bank startup, it's going to start ringing some bells to you and you see all those little banners and the billboards and the, the three times uh, a return on your money market account that everybody else is giving you. What are they doing, Joey? They are enticing you. They're trying, buying your deposits. Yeah, they're trying to get you to buy into putting money on deposit with them so that they can raise that capital. In real estate, they have a sign that's called, we buy ugly houses. What do they want you to do? They want you to call them so that they can buy your house and they can turn around and flip it. A bank who starts up, what they do is they say, we buy cheap uh, uh, de- uh, depositors money. <laughs> that's what we, we, we buy deposits. We need money because we need money to go lend to that's make right. money. Now, isn't that what we've been saying from day one on this podcast, though, Russ? The banks and Wall Street have us focused on one thing and that's it interest rate. So when you drive by and you see those banners and it's like, oh, I know my bank account right now is only paying me 0.2%, but this bank's going to give me 2.5% for my money. I immediately say, oh, well, I need to move my money there because of the well, interest rate. Yeah. Well, in, in 2016, give 2016's numbers because I'm not, um, I'm too cheap to go by the, the 2017 or 2018 numbers from Bank of America, but we got this one, right? Um, so under this report, it shows exactly what Bank of America's deposits were for 2016, $860 billion. That's now, a lot of money, by the way. For that $860 billion, they were really kind, uber kind. They sent $1.9 billion in interest payments to those depositors. Like, yay, clap, clap, right? Wow. Good job. Now, what did they do with those deposits? They turned around and lend it to somebody. Would Probably like to, to the same people that have deposits, by the way. <laughs> exactly, they did. Because, you know, they got car payments. They got relationship, relationship pricing on those loans. That's right. What would you like to think that they lent that $860 billion, paying $1.9 billion? Would you like to know how much they earned in interest on those deposits? Sure, hit me with it. $44.8 billion. Hmm. So they paid out a whopping 0.2% to depositors and they turned around and earned a 5.2% on those depositors money. Wow. Okay. So let's break that down. It sounds like a very simple thing, but let's, let's actually take it one step further. They, they sent out 0.2% and they earned 5.2%. So simply it sounds like there's a 5% difference, right? Yeah. That's what the bank made was 5%, right? But, but what but really happened? 
it's a 26 to one ratio. That's a 2,600% spread. Okay. I, if people aren't following that, here, here's the bottom line on that. You, I'm a visual learner. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a video in the show notes that shows this so you can see what's actually happening, the math behind it. You're not just taking our word for it. Please don't do that. Please go and actually see the numbers at work. But this is powerful. This is why when we say it's worth starting your own bank, like Nelson's talking about chapter or page 19 and 20, this is why it's worth it. Because now we are really making money on top of money to own the financing function in our lives. All right. So he goes through and he says, all right, let's talk about banks. Let's talk about the first national bank of Midland, Texas. He says this was the richest city in America per capita at the time. He said they had a loan portfolio of $1.5 billion. And here was the catch. 26% of those loans were non-performing or not getting the money back. Yeah. That means people ain't paying. <laughs> yeah. Well, he did a little research on this over time and he realized uh, that the majority of the 26% that wasn't being paid back was from the owners. Ah, so, yeah. okay. The, make another little reference here. What we talked about two chapters ago, Nelson said, that's called stealing the peas, <laughs> borrowing and not paying back. Yeah. It, he found out that basically all of these guys there who were kind of uh, shareholders of the bank and uh, board members were getting all of these loans and giving loans to themselves and going out and, you know, doing, oil rigs and stuff like that because there's big energy crisis at the time and they thought they're all going to go wait, make millions of dollars so none of them were making uh, loan repayments back and then when the whole energy crisis was over all those oil businesses uh, dried up and hence the bank that lent them the money that was really their um, golden goose if you will it it actually died yeah, so they, they, they not only out. lost they not only lost their oil business, but they lost their bank business. The oh. bank went under. Now, here's a really interesting thing because sometimes when we hear banks going under, we think about old oh, trusty FDIC. Mm. I mean, doesn't that make you feel good? Just uh -oh. got a good, good care. Russ, don't do it to him, Russ. Oh, don't do it to him, man. Don't, I mean, I'm thinking Tommy Boy right here. I'm thinking about taking a crap in a box and smacking guarantee on it. <laughs> I mean, you got to remember the classic Tommy Boy example there, but that's really when he starts breaking out, he says, did you know that the first National Bank of Midland, Texas at the time was the, the nation's largest bank? And when it went under, it was the losses on that bank were larger than the FDIC's total reserve balance. I did not know that. So if the FDIC did not go under, how in the world did they make it through if just one bank alone had more losses than their reserve balance. Somebody had to get bailed out. Who did that bailing? Didn't, uh, well, I, don't, I think I was too young at the time, but um, taxpayers. That, that's right. It out. That, those people who go to work every day, makes money, builds things and pays for things, turns around and bailed out the banks. Well, hey, you know, trusted government came around here not too recently and changed some laws on that. They created something called the Dodd-Frank Act. And our, our friends over at the Laura Murphy uh, division, I forget whatever I said, uh, I said division. <laughs> it's like they're an army unit or something. <laughs> we, have, we have a Laura Murphy division at Wealth of Elm Street, all that. That's right. Uh, uh, Laura Murphy report, they actually disclosed a bunch of the stuff. So Carlos Lari dug through some of those things. He's norm he's used to looking at failing businesses. So he went and looked up what was in that <laughs> act and realized that they no longer have a bailout for banks, Joey. They have what's called a bail in. Wow. That sounds like you're in a boat and people are throwing water in it. <laughs> That's right. Like, <laughs> yeah. You're in the boat and they're going to help you sink it. Right. It's man. like you're sitting on the Titanic and you're like shoveling water into the boat. Yeah. That's the opposite of what I want to do. Okay. So if you'd like to know what a bell in is with bell out is when people outside of the boat are helping you when it's inside of the boat, the outside of the people are sitting back laughing, eating popcorn and watching you sink that's kind of what this is. Basically, they said the people who have deposits on the, uh, at a bank, they automatically get those deposits exchanged for shares of the bank. Ah, oh, wow. That sounds good. Isn't that awesome? I mean, you got to create liquidity. So, hey, those who, if keeping, you know, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars on deposit at the bank, congratulations, you are a new shareholder. 
of a failing business. <laughs> this is terrible. Man, this, this is, is not where really you want to be. But if you think about that as business owners, what happens? We tend to get really busy. We tend to leave large amounts of cash on the positive banks because we're so busy. We don't even think about it. You and I, we see that little average daily ledger balance and you go yeah. look at the math on that. We know that one, inflation is killing us, right? Yes. Just that money sitting on deposit for a long piece of time is killing us. The 0% return is not helping the cause either. And it's just this idle cash. Well, yeah. what happens if we did have a failure in the banking system, the FDIC couldn't bail it out, then ta-da, we now own bank stock. Congratulations. Yeah, but isn't it, I mean, at the, at the very bare minimum here, you have money in a, in a bank account. Whether or not we're talking about this, we're not trying to scare you with the whole Dodd-Frank thing. We're just trying to be real. Oh, I'm scaring you. If you're not scared, I would be scared. That is, <laughs> this isn't a scare tactic. This is literally, I'm scared. But, at, okay, well, Russ is scaring you. But if, if we're really thinking about this thing, you don't feel good about having hundreds of thousands of dollars in a bank account, right? Because you know it's not working for you. It's just a placeholder. It's just, it might as well be in a mattress somewhere. And so we all have felt that at some point or another. Man, I just, I got to get this money working for me. This is not the place to do it. That's the reason why we are using a much better savings tool. Now, of course, Nelson gets into the next chapter, actually breaking down how a dividend paying whole life insurance policy, it becomes the perfect place to build your banking system. But we're going to get into that next time. But this is why we talk about changing the location of where that money resides. Well, but here's the thing is that, you know, if you, know that a bank can be a profitable organization, right? I mean, they, of course. Do, they do make money. Now, it, we don't have the ability to lend 10 times every dollar we have on deposit. That's the fractional reserve banking that it goes through in this chapter. We, Nelson, we're not going to call that a con game, by the way. Yeah. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time there because that's not something we can do ourselves. We can't participate. But, yeah. But when I look at this chapter and I want to break down, like, how does this apply to us? And he says, a bank can only lend its deposits. It can't lend its own capital. I, I want to apply that, Joey, because this is yeah. a little bit ahead of the game. But think about that in, in terms of the way we deposit money into our insurance policies. A lot of times we take large lump sums, money that's just sitting on deposit at someone else's account, right? And we will transfer that and lump sum that into our insurance policy. Right. Then we will take savings, money that we were sending out, whether it's for other things that we we're saving for or money that we were using to pay down, you know, principal loan debt. And we allocate that money as our, our deposits. Now that's the money that allows us to go out and take over the debts that we have. That's the money that allows us to go buy real estate and create new deposits, even double our deposits. And that's the cycle that I think of as I look at this book. I say, man, that's what we're trying to get to, right? Right. But okay, so let's break that second part down. So again, re reiterate. One, you have a lump sum somewhere. That could be the seed money that you're essentially dumping in to a policy as a one big lump sum. But you have to have an ongoing savings amount. So let's talk about that second step, your savings. You know, there's a great analogy in The Richest Man in Babylon. Break yeah. that down for us, Russ. And again, we keep talking about this. We got to actually do a review of Richest Man of Babylon soon. Yeah, Richest Man of Babylon is a wonderful book. It's 100-year-old. George Clayson wrote it. it it's kind of written in the old English. So it's a little bit funny to read. It's something like, you know, start thy purse to fattening or something like that. <laughs> it says some funny, interesting stories. But the basic premise, what I love, is that the Richest Man of Babylon had the nicest of things. And whenever they started asking him, well, how did you get to this point? He had you know, these seven principles, but really the kind of genesis behind it is that he only spent, Joey, 70% of every dollar he made. That included like in today's terms, taxes, tithing, and other things. Well, that extra 30% is what he was using to multiply his gold. That was what he would say, if you had debts, you should use 20% of that to be paying down on those debts. Right. It's not like if I've got car payments and mortgages, that gets to go into that 20%. No, he's going to say, that's part of your lifestyle. Right. He, the extra pay down stuff that you're trying to do, that should be a part of this 30%. And we, when we organize our finances in a very simple way, and we say, man, I can live off 70%. And you know what? If I, if I grow my income 50% this year, I get to grow 
my expenditures. I can do that. It's not like I have to live poor for the rest of my life. Right. But when you have a formula like, hey, I'm going to put 30%, now I know what I can do and I can start finding ways to do it in ways that will actually increase my wealth. Yeah. So if you, let's say you're reviewing your policies that you have right now and you're like, man, I'm nowhere near 30%. You got an opportunity. It's not an overnight thing, perhaps. It's maybe just you're just stepping into that, but that should be a goal that we're getting to that point to getting up to 30%. Here's a question I have, Joey. Do most people see their deposits into their policy that, and the insurance company calls those premiums? Did they see those as deposits or what do they typically see those as? Oh, oh man, this is the, okay. If you want to stack up one of the hardest things to, to get your brain to change thinking on in this process is to stop thinking about deposits into a policy as an expense and more as a deposit. And I, I, can, I just called it a deposit because that's where, I mean, you and I have gone through this process too. I'm not saying that we're immune to it, but this is after 10 years of doing it, it's easy to see it as a deposit. But just the other day, I was meeting with a fairly new client and they were coming to me and they were stressed. I mean, this is reality. They're sitting in my office and they're like, man, Joey, I don't know how we're going to pay these premiums in September. So immediately I'm thinking, ding, ding, ding. They're feeling the weight here like it's an expense. I said, well, so walk me through what's going on. Well, they just bought a car for their son. They've got, they're just buying a house. They're transitioning from one house to another. There's a lot of expenses and moving and all these things are going on. And so what's happening is, they are spending cash out of one pocket. This would be their traditional bank, their regions bank or whoever it is. And they've got their policy over here that's full of cash and they're not using it. I said, wait a minute. So when you bought your son's car, how did you do it? Well, I bought it with cash. Wait a minute. You, you could have used a policy to pay that. So now what we've done is we're trying to get $2 to do one job. Yeah. Trying to get $2 to do one job instead of $1 to do two. Which one's more efficient? And so they said, oh my gosh, you're right. Why didn't that? So this is the part of the process of starting to think, man, that money goes into that policy. It's captured. And then I can put it to work. So if you anyway. go, yeah, when you look at this chapter and he says a bank can only lend deposits, what are we doing with these insurance policies? We are depositing money. So that should the, the bells in our head should go off to us that that is money that we can lend again. So if we're going to go buy a car, where are we going to borrow money from? Someone else's banker for ours. Always start at home. Yeah. If we're going to go buy a rental property, where would, should we lend money from? Start at home. Yeah. Home I mean, bank. You have this at your disposal. Now, sometimes we'll choose to use someone else's bank, right? Maybe the terms are better and we're okay with the cash flow when we decide to do that because there's other things that our money would be better allocated to. So there's not a complete one size fits all, but here's the key. You got to be in the position. That's right. You, got, you have to be in the position. And if you are leaving enough cash sitting in someone else's bank, that tells you you're not only subject to loss, as we talked about a second ago, and I really don't think there's going to be another run on the banks. Hopefully, this never comes into play. But at the, at the worst case, the stealing that's happening from inflation and idle cash alone should make us go, we've got to get that at work for ourselves. Absolutely. So I, I'm going to bring something up here. This, because of the way of how we think is so important, we just got done talking about just deposits versus an expense uh, in our premiums. This, joining this community is so critical. You're surrounded. You may be the only person in your city that knows what in the world we're talking about when it comes to life insurance as an asset, using it for a banking policy. And you need to be around like-minded people. So this community, I'm just going to put it out there, community.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com is where you're going to be the first one to see this thing launched. You're going to get 50% off the actual cost because you're an early adopter. We want to in invite you in at the very front end, but you're going to learn how to create the environment that you can control. You're going to add, add imagination. All these things are Nelson, what Nelson teaches us. This is nothing new, but you're going to add imagination by hearing what other people are doing and sitting in the room when deals are brought out, what people are doing with their policies. And then lastly, you're going to learn how to use your environment the proper way. So, 
make sure and sign up. This is such an awesome opportunity. Yeah. I, you're you're going to get to be around like-minded people that's going to help push you to go further. So today's episode was on creating a bank like the ones you already know about. You've already heard us talk a lot about the banking industry. There wasn't probably too many things, but I, I think the one thing in here for me, the trigger was that thought of, hey, my deposits are the thing for me to lend. So if I can always think of, if I ever get you know hung up on what is that uh, problem I have with putting more money in here? Oh, this is money that I can borrow against. And uh, I'm going to end this part because at the end, he starts talking about uh, sawmills and he starts talking about this concept of co-generation. I think about that in relationship to our insurance policies, Joey, as we yep. lead into the next chapter that's going to really dive into dividend paying life insurance. What's one of the things that you thought of when you read co-generation and relationship to our insurance policies? Well, I think I think the critical thing here is just the correlation with how we are in two businesses at once, right? We are already operating. In fact, I was just meeting with a business owner today, and he's been he's been working off of a line of credit from a a, a local bank, and he's so excited, man! He finally got that thing paid down, but he knows it's inevitable that he's going to have to borrow against it for cash flow in the future because the business has ebbs and flows. This is the reality of being an entrepreneur business owner. And I said, I put three things on the table and I said, look, here's you, here's the bank and here's the cash flow of your business. And I said, there's somebody between you and the cash flow of your business. It's the bank. And that's going to continue to happen the entire time your business is in operation. You can either take the benefit of that and get rid of this third party or you can allow them to take the benefit. And I said, you know, then we broke down and looked at what the policy would look like for him. And it said that he was going to have $60,000 a year in free cash flow, income tax free cash flow. That would be the benefit at the end of all this function if he just took the place of the bank. Can you imagine how quickly he said, this is a no brainer. I'm in the banking business now. I'm just giving it up to somebody else. Yeah, I'm, I'm just delegating that to another party that gets to all the benefits. So I, I love the way that this book is helping us think through these subject matters. I want you to uh, continue reading along with us in this book. Next time, we're going to jump into pages 21 through 25. We're going to delve right into the dividend paying life insurance. We already know a lot about that. But I'm sure there's a few little nuggets in here that we're going to be able to um, help you mine through that maybe you didn't see when you read it the first or second time. So as always, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.